Hello and welcome. My name is Manuel Quintana with Pragmatic Works, and here we're going to take a quick moment, just a couple of minutes here, to discuss Power BI workspaces, what their intentions are, how you need to be using them, and as well the roles associated with these workspaces. This is going to be critical around collaboration and sharing in your organization. So that's what we're going to be taking a look at here. So we can see I have this up here. It's a couple of quick slides, and then we're just going to dive into the Power BI service. And we're actually going to go ahead and create a workspace, talk about the different roles, so you can be prepared and understand how we can appropriately use these objects in the service and make sure we're inviting the right people into our workspaces, right? I see a lot of confusion with this, you know, versus sharing and collaboration. These are two different things. Now, we're not going to go into the depth and the side for sharing in this video. It's primarily focused around the collaborative effort to a degree. You can see there's always little disclaimers, little caveats, and I'll discuss it. But for the most part, Workspaces is meant for collaboration. Fellow report writers, those who are going to be man managing or administering data sets and sharing reports with other users. So we're, of course, talking about workspaces. Once again, all about sharing and collaboration. There's been some recent changes with how you create these workspaces. There's some additional new options, which is important for understanding. And we're going to go in and look at this. Now, the main thing is there is effectively really two limitations. I've only really listed one here is that you have to have a pro license assigned to you in order to create a workspace. Now, that being said, this is kind of a conversation now with the introduction of Power BI, a premium per user account. Technically, that is also something in play here because you're going to see you can have premium per user workspaces. So. When you create a Power BI workspace, whether it's a Power Pro user uh, or a dedicated capacity, still the person who's creating this workspace who will become the first and initial administrator must at minimum have a Pro license. That's the case regardless if you have dedicated capacity in your organization or not. The second little piece of this puzzle that potentially has like a limit, limitation factor is within the admin portal. Within the Power BI admin space there, you can actually restrict the ability of creating workspace within your organization. So even if you do have a pro license or a premium per user license, this feature might potentially be something that has been turned off at the organizational level. So it'll just be about communicating, saying, hey, I need to make a new workspace. You know, the ones we have out there aren't really organized or meet our needs or you know, whatever it might be. If you need a new workspace, it's turned off. You're just going to have to have that conversation. Now, once you Get that all squared away once you're able to actually create that workspace as mentioned when you create it you let's say i am the one who creates the workspace i am set as the only member of that workspace and let me try not to use that word i am the only um, individual that's part of that workspace and i'm assigned the admin role the reason i want to stay away from using member is because when we look at the various roles viewer contributor member so that's why i didn't want to kind of mess that one up and then of course there is admin. So this is just a very brief description of what each of the roles can do. The only one here that really has a small caveat, right? Contributor, member, admin, viewer is the unique one around the statement I'm just about to make. Anyone who will be invited into a workspace also must have a pro license, right? So I mentioned you got to have pro to create it, but if you're going to be a contributor, member, or you're going to be adding additional admins, those users must have pro licenses assigned to them. The viewer is a little unique. When we have a shared capacity environment, and sure to check out my previous video when I was talking about capacities inside of Power BI service, a shared capacity basically means you don't have any dedicated capacity, so you're in a shared capacity environment. Basically, users are the only ones individually licensed, either PPU, premium per user, or pro. Then viewer, if you invite them into a workspace, must also have a pro license. And they really can't do anything other than effectively just viewing items and objects and viewing the results of a data set if you're given their correct permission to it. It's read only. But if you are using dedicated capacity, the viewer role, if assigned to an individual when being invited into a workspace, does not require a pro license. So small little caveat there. There are probably some use cases and scenarios where you feel like that might be the best way to get someone in so they can look and read whatever dashboard reports are in a workspace. Not my preferred method, right? Using the various different share options that are there, whether it be through a SharePoint, a site, whether you're embedding it inside of Teams, whether you're just doing a traditional share and they get a link, right? I like going that route better. 
so you don't have to teach your users the ins and outs of workspaces, right? Because if they're a viewer, they need to know what the workspace, how to navigate, and all that fun stuff. So depending on the you know savviness of your user, that might make sense. And you know it is a choice to make. But I wanted to showcase viewer. The only role here that is slightly different that does not require pro license if your organization or if this workspace is associated with dedicated capacity. That's the more correct way to say it. Your company could absolutely have dedicated capacity, but you need to make sure your workspace is uh, assigned that. You're going to see here in a moment, we can specify what types of workspace it's going to be upon the creation of that workspace. So that's what we're going to check out. One other small thing, obviously that's a brief description of the breakdowns of the roles. Definitely you want to head over into the Microsoft documentation. You can see if you just type in um, Power BI workspace roles, anything of that nature, that'll get you to the official documentation where you can see a very, very evident and clear breakdown where they talk about what does a viewer have, what does a contributor have, what does a member. Naturally, as you go higher up the chain here, it includes everything that the previous one has, just more. And there are some kind of caveats and nuances. So they'll specify, hey, contributors can update apps, but you need to specify it within the workspace settings. And I'll be showing you that. So even though they can only view and interact with an item, which has more specificity here on object five, even if you don't have a pro license, you can view and interact if they're in a premium capacity, right? That's what I was talking about. So good information. If things change and are updated, you're always going to be wanting to go to the Microsoft documentation. So make sure you check this out. This breaks it down super granularly. But let me head over here, right? We're over now inside of the Power BI service. I'm in Power Pragmatic Works uh, Tenants, and I'm just going to go through the process. You can see here's all of these workspaces. It should be noted. Everybody, if you're brand new to the service, there is something known as a My Workspace. Everybody has this. It should be noted that the My Workspace is a unique workspace and it is limited in its features. You cannot invite other users to it. And this is something that's actually inaccessible from the outside. So you very much want to treat your My Workspace as a development area. It's very not, um, it's not recommended to be sharing things like from a production perspective from your My Workspace. Because if something's wrong, something's off with the reset, something like there, nobody's going to be able to access this and remedy it. So you do want to be cautious with the My Workspace. Traditionally, this is not something that's done at a production level. Um, you will create app workspaces. Sometimes users call them organizational workspaces. That is where all of your work is going to be done primarily. For me, when I'm doing teaching and training, sometimes I'll use the My Workspace because it suits my needs. It should be noted that as far as like Power BI's idea of, hey, you want to try it out for free, technically you can publish to your My Workspace without having a pro account. So that's a way you can check out what's going on and not have to be have a paid license. But once again, not going to be the area where you're going to want to do this if it's anything related that needs to be managed or maintained by an organization at large. So watch out with the My Workspace and how you use it. So if we expand this, you can see here are all of my app workspaces that I'm either a part of, I've been invited to, or that I've created for myself. There's a lot going on here. We have all those different training classes, so we make sure we break them down. But I'm gonna go ahead and select the option here at the bottom. I am a pro user. If we go over here in the upper right corner, we can see I have a pro account. Um, so I meet that first limitation. And also if we continue, if I go back here into the workspaces, at the organizational level, at the tenant level here in the admin portal settings, it has not been disabled. At least specifically, I have access to be able to create this. It's at this juncture that we would encounter an error if that was the case. So working down the list, right? When creating this workspace, you have the ability to go ahead and upload an image to represent it. You might have seen in my list, a lot of them are pretty bland and you know not exciting. But if you want to put an image so that users can see it, to recognize it, you're absolutely more than welcome to do that. Then we need to provide a workspace name. So I'm going to go here and just put Power BI Workspace. YouTube, right? There's something in there. You can see it's doing a quick test to verify if this name is available, and it is. Should I want to add a description? We can absolutely do that. And you can see this will take you back over to the Microsoft documentation, which is nice. But under advanced, we have a couple of options. Um, contact lists. Should anyone have any information or questions or want to request access to this workspace, who should that be going to? By default, we have the radial button selected as the workspace admin. So naturally, when we start, I'm going to be the only administrator, but as I add more, those will be the users who are contacted if anyone has any questions about it or are requesting access to the workspace. 
If you didn't want to go that route, you can absolutely specify users and or groups in the standard way that you would. You can see it's tied to my Azure Active Directory. So if I wanted it to be Mitchell, if I wanted it to be Devin, let's say here, just like this, I could just add that in or even so, right? If I wanted to go ahead, you can actually leverage these AD groups. So you can see I can use this trainers groups, which would include myself, Matt, all the rest of the team that you know here and love from Pragmatic Rich, right? So a couple ways we can go about it. We can also, if we like, tie in, we would have to, in this case, provide the actual URL link, but we could tie in a workspace to a OneDrive. So you have a kind of group-wide storage area for files. So you can specify this. And then we come to a relatively newer aspect of the workspace, right? And this is where before, when we just had, you know, you were either pro and you didn't have premium or you did have premium, you would basically say, I'm going to point this to dedicated. You would turn it on. We're going to turn this on for dedicated capacity. Now it's no longer the case. We actually have to specify which license mode our workspace will operate in. And you can see, please set the license type required to access the content. Definitely goes to the, to the Microsoft documentation. So check it out as updates appear. But basically, Pro is kind of the, the historical one that we we're always used to. Newer coming to the mix is the premium per user, right? Users that are part of this uh, workspace must have that specific type of account. They must have that specific type of license, right? Premium per user, it's newer, $20 per month. It takes advantage of some of those dedicated capacity uh, features, but at an individual level. So just have to take that into account and see if, you know, that's the route you want to go. And there is a workspace specifically there so you could take advantage of those features. Premium per user, you got to be a premium per user account holder. Then, of course, we have below the third option, premium per capacity. This is the traditional sense, right? We have dedicated capacity, quite often referred to as Power BI Premium. You can go ahead and specify that. And once you make that radial button decision, you can associate it with the particular node in question in case you have various different capacities that you own and manage at an organizational level. And then, of course, lastly, as we look down here, we have embedded capacities. This is only used for basically embedding results in for customer scenarios. This relates to some Azure services here, but you can create a very specific workspace that will support those scenarios. So you have to make this right choice, right? So in our case, you can see in this organization within our this tenant that I'm currently logged in as, we don't have dedicated capacity. I am not assigned a premium per user license. So all the rest of these options are actually grayed out for me. So I don't have those options, which is good. So no mistakes can be made. Um, so pro is going to be the licensing mode we use in this scenario. Down if we continue, you can say template apps. They're just for things that you can develop outside the organization. Definitely check out the documentation. We're not going to be going in that today's call, uh, today's video. Um, and then the last one is something that you can actually amend. You could do now. You could change it later. But this is what we mentioned, that little caveat. If someone is assigned the contributor role, which once again, that documentation is out there, they can publish out there. They really can't do anything by default relating to apps. But if you choose this option, you will allow the contributor role to be able to update the app for this specific workspace, right? So a couple of options there you can set up. Once you've created the workspace, you can see this is that main landing page and you can access under the settings area the very information that we just saw. Maybe you didn't have uh, an image you had initially. Let me go ahead and upload that. Those advanced options that we talked about and saw here, we can make and update those changes. Maybe now is the time that we want to allow contributors to update. And you can see we still have access to this premium tab, which allows us to change that, li um, that license mode. Once now that we've created this workspace, the nice part is there also is this option for Azure connections. This is where you can actually make a connection and uh, sync basically link this up and integrate this with Azure Data Lake Gen 2 storage accounts. So you can see you are using this and you're leveraging this. You can actually connect to it and associate this right inside of your Power BI workspace and have access to the information inside of there. So the use default Azure connection within the Power BI portal, you can actually define a, just a default organizationally use Azure Data Lake Gen 2 storage account. That's what that check mark is. The Connect to Azure would be doing something other than that, where you would have to go through the process and sure you have access to it. You do need to do access control with Power BI identity. So there's a little more that goes into that process on making sure you can make this connection. But also, there's a fantastic document when hitting Learn More that walks you through and tells you what do you need to have done 
for that Azure Data Lake Gen 2 storage so that this Power BI workspace will have access to the resources inside that storage account. Definitely cool stuff, guys. Now, that is our workspace settings, which as you can see, you can actually access in you go in the workspace tab, right? If I go to find this workspace that we created, you can actually hit the ellipsis and it gives you those same options right here. But I like doing it right here through the very UI that we're looking at, right? Why not? Access. So right now, I stand alone. And you can see I've been granted admin permissions. Um, I can change this. You always at minimum, would I would like to say, want to have two admins as part of a workspace, right? So definitely something you want to consider just for maintaining a workspace itself. But now it's all about adding users, right? Who do I want to add? Maybe I want to add, you know, Mitchell from the team. Once again, I can go ahead and add Devin from the team. Or I can leverage these Azure Active Directory groups and involve multiple people. So you can see there's this trainers at Pragmatic Works. This actually uh, has, once again, everybody on the training team itself. Now, when you do the groups, just remember, though, we are assigning roles based off of what we're placing here. So if I do all of trainers, I have to choose one specific role that will be basically assigned to everybody in that, that, that group, in that scenario. So if you want to get that granular detail and say, you know what, I'm going to invite Mitchell. But Mitchell is only going to be a contributor, right? I go ahead and add him in. There he is. He'll get a little notification that's been done. And then I think, you know what, Matt, he's more trustworthy. Let me go ahead and make him another admin into my workspace, which of course, different set of permissions, different capabilities. So this is all it's set. Those users are informed. And I say, you know what? I didn't mean to make Matt an admin. Instead, let me go ahead and make him a member, right? The order is viewer, contributor, member, and admin. Now these users, after adding them and giving them access to this workspace, this will appear for them in their list. So they will have access now to deploy here. Depending on their level of access, they can potentially, uh, you know, contributors and above will be able to publish items here. Uh, members and above, they can go ahead and add things and manage the app. Unless I toggle that box and let contributors be able to update an app. But this is how we want to go ahead and do this. And once again, the users here, this is for collaboration. The individuals that we want to be able to basically get access into these workspaces should be fellow report writers and creators, users who should have access to the underlying data sets, users who are probably going to be responsible for who is this report meaning to be shared with and those types of items. If it's really just somebody who's meant to just consume those reports and dashboards that we're creating, doing the traditional uh, method of using the various share options would be that route that you want to go. So hopefully, this quick, fast little video around workspaces, the various license modes, the roles that are available to us, gave you some insights, and hopefully now you feel good about how and when I should create workspaces, uh, who should I be inviting to them, and the various different options that are available at our disposal. So I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next one.